kind of let you start from wherever, but I was just going to ask about maybe your transition from high school to college or your college experience, and we'll go from there. Sure. Um, so I guess, like, my transition from high school to college, um, I I was in this class called uh, Multimedia with some pretty influential teachers of mine. Uh, one of them was Joe Fathery, and another one was Craig Lindvall. And what we did was we made movies. And uh, so uh, at the end of the year, we had this uh, film festival. It was called the AHA Film Festival. I think this is around, this was 2009. And uh, I created this zombie movie. Um, and um, one of the other actors uh, was uh, would soon become my, my girlfriend after I graduated. <laughs> Nice. This uh, you know, big event it was pretty, you know, it was small at the time, but like when you're a high schooler um, and you make a film and it's like this big, you know, big deal, um, it was pretty neat. And so we started dating and then she, she followed me to college and I went to college for cinematography for my first mm -hmm. year because, um, you know, I had a, a huge influence on me, but, um, and I'd always wanted, wanted to do things with art because I'd always been artsy. Um, always, you know, I thought about graphic design. Um, but, uh, you know, first year at Southern Illinois, Univers Southern Illinois University of Carbondale was, was, uh, wasn't the greatest, you know, I was in the dorms and then I went back uh, after, after I spent one year there in the dorms uh, with my girlfriend and a few other friends of mine from my hometown uh, I actually went back because she wanted to go to nursing school and, you know, she, she came with me to, uh, to Carbondale. So I was like, okay, well, I'll, I'll follow you back home and go to the community college where, um, the nursing school was. So, mm -hmm. so that's what I did. And then, um, nursing was, was too hard for her, uh, because it's just, it's such a, a difficult field to be in you know to see uh, sick and dying people and it's just it really takes its toll so I think she decided she didn't really want to do that and she wanted to do more cosmetology related things mm -hmm. so while we we're in in uh back in my hometown uh we actually got married and then I transitioned to art school and and uh and then after and then so I spent a few years in art school in my hometown uh, and then basically graduated with my associates, but mm -hmm. then I didn't know what to do with it. So we basically spent a year not knowing what we were doing or where, where we were going and we were married and uh, we were just, we just felt lost and we had no money and we were broke. And, mm -hmm. you know, I thought that, you know, going to school for art, they would teach you about how to market your stuff, how to, how to make things to sell them, but that's not really what they teach you. They just teach you, how to make art mm -hmm. they don't teach you anything else and so I was kind of stuck you know I didn't I didn't know what to do with the art that I made and so I needed to find something that uh, would make me money essentially um, so we, we wound up just living like I was just working at Menards in you know the rock and block section and mm -hmm. she was working I think in an auto store and we were just making ends meet and uh, wound up living. There's a pole barn that her stepdad had. We ended up living in a barn for a year. Um, so that was a, a particular struggle. I, I thought that if I could get through that, I could get through anything. Yeah. You know? And uh, because the pipes would freeze in the winter and, uh, you know, it's just, it just dirty. I mean, we, we rigged it up. So it was livable. Like we put carpet in and we, mm -hmm. uh, did everything we could but I mean, it was still a barn at the end of the day um, but uh, yeah from there I guess that's when I decided okay I really need to get focused and figure out how to make money creatively and that's when mm -hmm. I came across industrial design um, and industrial design if you don't know what that is it's, it's basically like product design physical products um, sketching it's basically like the user side of engineering um, mm -hmm. research um, user experience, um, how people relate to products, um, you know, 
color theory, ergonomics, um, things like that. And so I became really interested in that. I said, okay, well, I already have my associates. Maybe I can get my bachelor's in industrial design, go back to Southern Illinois where I first went to college, and then we can go there. And I think that's where the journey really started um, for me on this rabbit hole down into just all these struggles that I ran into mm-hmm. um, that kind of led me where, where I am today. But uh, that's only the start of it. I mean, that's just, that's just, yeah. If, I, it's, it's if you want to keep of, going, like keep going to um, sure. like pick up from where you left off. I'm, okay. I'm engaged. <laughs> okay. I, do you have any questions like so far? Like on, uh, no, cause this is kind of the purpose of these interviews is to hear like about your journey and how it's, it's not like, Oh, I'm school graduate job. It's like I had all these different leaps and jumps, and right. so this is great. Well, I guess before I before I move on, because that's like the major like transition point was like okay, moving on to Southern Illinois Southern Illinois University to get my bachelor's um, was like the reason why I got married in the first place was was just a number of reasons, and, and I think this is important for people to hear uh, in relationships. You know, whether it's a long-term relationship, whether that you know you're you're thinking about getting married, or whether you know, it's just the amount of um, just thinking about are you you know are you doing it to be to stay safe? Are you are mm-hmm. you doing it because you don't think you have you know other options, um, or are you you know are you comfortable with yourself uh, before you jump into something like that? Because I mean, the fact is, I was 19, mm-hmm. I was very very young. And, um, so I think that there was, there was a lot I hadn't thought about in regards to, uh, what each party needed, I guess. And a lot that I didn't know about myself, uh, yet. Um, so I guess I'll just leave that on that note. Um, but, uh, yeah, to pick off, to pick up back in Carbondale, I, uh, moved there I got a, I immediately got a job at a liquor store because that's the two people I went to Carbondale with uh, from my hometown they mm-hmm. stayed there while I went back home at, um, the first year and so they were already there so they got me a job immediately at a liquor store um, and that's kind of when a little bit of my alcoholism started um, because when you're just when you're working until 2 a.m. on a Saturday night in mm-hmm. a college town you're going to, you're going to drink a little bit, you know, you're going to break the rules and, 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 uh, and I think, you know, because I had transitioned away from like physical jobs, like I was at Menards working outside, lifting lumber and lifting rocks and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't have that physical outlet and I was actually deteriorating my body with alcohol and just the, just the amount of negative influences in my life that I could, that I couldn't identify necessarily, um, were affecting me in ways that I didn't realize at the time. And so those slowly took their toll on my mindset and things like that. But, um, you know, I, I kept, uh, you know, I kept going. And one, th- one thing I forgot to mention was that w- while I was living in the barn, we were, we were so broke that uh, that I had I was thinking about starting you know to grow illegal mushrooms to mm-hmm. to compensate for the lack of money that I had and to try to just try to get by and so when I got to Carbondale that actually I actually made that happen mm-hmm. and uh, you know I had this whole setup and I didn't really think anything of the legal ramifications of it um, and, uh, and the reason why I chose that, it wasn't because it, it was, I mean, it was easy to do, but it was more so because I had had an experience before with that particular substance that, um, sort of like, it really helped me in a way, identify a lot of the, the negativities that I was experiencing in my own mind, I guess, mm-hmm. um, a lot of the internal dialogue, the negative internal dialogue that I tell myself sometimes, uh, because I, 
I think ever since I can remember, I've str- struggled with depression and anxiety and, uh, you know, self doubt and all these things. And, um, that really helped me, uh, kind of gain a lot of insight and clarity into why those things were happening. And, and so that's why I think I chose that. I, I felt like my excuse was that, okay, yeah, I'm making money, but mm-hmm. I'm also helping people. And I think that was an irresponsible way to go about it because I wasn't really helping people. Maybe I did, but once it left my hands, it's like, there's no way to determine who's going to use that or how they're going to use it. And so, mm-hmm. um, uh, so that's what I started doing. I mean, this is very much a nonlinear thing. I didn't go yeah. to college and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, just, just do college. college. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't, you know, I was married before I went to college and then I, you know, I got my associates because I thought I had to have my associates before I got my bachelor's. Um, so very much so nonlinear. Um, but, uh, yeah. Um, so basically one of my, one of my friends at the time, it was me and him kind of teaming up on, on the thing uh, in college. Uh, he was, so I would grow them and then he would distribute them. Mm-hmm. And, uh, basically, uh, what happened was he somehow got picked up. Uh, I don't know what happened. I still don't know to this day how he, how they found out about him, but, uh, basically one day I'm, I'm laying in bed and, uh, I just, I hear a knock on my door. My, my ex-wife, she, she goes and, and answers it. And then the DEA, I think it was the DEA, the, um, Williamson County, um, it was two counties. And then the, the school, uh, investigators, Mm-hmm. just busted in like guns pointing at me for a substance yeah. that really shouldn't be scheduled the way it is. Mm-hmm. Um, and I highly recommend anybody that's listening right now, look up um, psilocybin and mm-hmm. uh, psilocybin mushrooms and how they're scheduled in the history of it. Um, because it's a pretty interesting story. And um, in my opinion, I think, that the ra- the legal ramifications for um, not only growing them but just possessing them and um, consuming them are far too large for what for the actual ramifications of consu- like the, the physical ramifications and mental ramifications are when you mm-hmm. take them. Um, you know, I'm not a I'm not a scientist, but uh, you can look at all the science that's been done on it. Um, if you go to maps.org, they have a bunch of peer-reviewed um, double-blind scientific studies on, mm-hmm. on the positive benefits of psilocybin and, and what it can do for people in terms of you know, mental health and things like that. Um, yeah, I've been doing some reading too. Have you, have you been hear, hearing about it? Yeah, I've been doing some reading, watching some documentaries and all that kind of stuff. So Yeah, I think it's becoming a little bit more mainstream now, which, which I'm really, uh, really happy about because this particular story with mine is, is, um, I think if, you know, it's hard to talk about, um, even now, it, it, now that's mm-hmm. becoming mainstream and, you know, but I feel like this is something I struggled with, you know, after I got arrested, um, was that, you know, I thought I was a bad person, mm-hmm. uh, because, because I'd made this huge mistake and, uh, I, I felt like I was immoral because I had made that mistake because I equated the law to morality and that's not yeah. the case at all. And it took me a while to, because it's just like, just my self-esteem just, just plummeted because I just felt like this horrible person. How could I be so stupid? How could I just, you know, I'm, I'm just a terrible person. And they want you to feel that way. That's how they treat you when you're in jail. And that's how they, 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 they just, they want you to feel like you are, scum like scum not scum. a person yeah, yeah. And, and that's the way the system is designed too and the system is designed to to rope you right back in it's not designed to rehabilitate you it's designed no. to like punish you and further like 
diminish you, which makes it even harder to go back into society and they just expect you to like figure it out. Yeah. It's designed to keep you, keep you in. And if you, if you escape, somehow escape the system, if you're fortunate enough to be able to escape the system, uh, they'll keep throwing fines at you, unexpected mm-hmm. fines. And I'm still, I'm still dealing with fines to this day. Um, and this was years ago. Just for that one situation back then. So I had 35 years over my head while Jesus I Christ. was trying to graduate college. Yeah. And I was going through a divorce at the same time. Mm-hmm. And so during all that time, I became a university innovation fellow and while I was dealing with all that stuff. Hell yeah. I feel like it's just like my whole world was just like a huge grenade had just exploded um, mm-hmm. because, you know, I was dealing with the pain of a, of a divorce and a breakup. Um, and then, you know, the, the, the paranoia involved in, in and the PTSD, which I didn't know was PTSD at the time. Yeah. Um, I, I struggled with P- PTSD from years for years because, um, you know, you have, you're asleep in your bed and then they come in and bust in and all mm-hmm. of a sudden you're in a, a cell and, um, and forcefully thrown in there. And, um, but I think, I think overall, I just, I learned a lot about, mental health, you know, trauma and getting my self-esteem back and, and just basically I had to kind of reinvent myself because everything, basically everything I was doing was the wrong way. I was hanging out with the wrong people. Mm -hmm. I was, I had the wrong habits. I was just doing all the wrong things. And so, um, so when you were in the, in that cell and you can, I don't know if you want to go back to the situation itself and how that played out, but kind of when you were in that moment and you have 35 years hanging over your head, it's kind of a decision of like, okay, I'm either going to sit here and, and accept this or I'm going to change it. And it, I, it, you like got out of that and you, I know a little bit of your backstory. I'll let you tell it, but you did the latter and um could you speak a bit more to how you kind of pushed through basically sure um i guess while i was in the cell um and and you know this is a this is not even a a big situation i was only in jail for three days um you know there's people that are in jail for years and so i Mm -hmm. can't really speak to that um and i was never in prison i was only in jail and Mm -hmm. you know but I just, it, it was enough to let me see just the, the cold, just heartlessness of the, of the system as a whole. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I was, it, they keep it cold because they don't, people get, people get riled up when it's warmer. And so when you keep it cold, you're more docile. Um, and so they give you like a little towel. So I had a mm-hmm. towel wrapped around my neck because that's where most of my body heat was escaping. Mm-hmm. And then, so they were, they were teasing me over the intercom and they were teasing me about, Oh, Hey, is this guy gonna, gonna go hang himself, you know, off the railing, Jeez. all that stuff. Then these, these are the people that are in charge of the jail over the intercom. Yeah. It's ridiculous. And so, um, and, and I was going through what they call jailhouse prayers where you, uh, you know, you, you get in touch with God because, going to change your ways and everything so i was praying a lot um and um and then i was writing i was writing a lot and one of the things that i kept like writing to myself and reminding myself was like that because it was freaky man i mean you one day you're not even thinking about the ramifications of what you're doing because you're young and stupid and you're just you're you're dealing with drugs that you haven't even looked into the, the mm-hmm. laws of and uh basically um, when I was in there, I just, uh, I kept, I kept writing. I said, one day this will, this will all just be a memory. And, mm-hmm. and that was enough to kind of get me by. And then I think the third day, I don't know if I was dissociating, but I kind of got used to everything. And that was, that was weird for me because mm-hmm. I was like, I was kind of disturbed by the fact that I got used to being in jail like mm-hmm. that's not something i would like to be okay with <laughs> you know <laughs> but it was kind of strange i was like yeah okay whatever i had 
I had succumbed to it. You know, I had succumbed mm-hmm. to the reality. I was like, whatever, this is, this is reality, whatever. And so the dichotomy of getting thrown in there and freaking out about it, mm-hmm. about having 35 years over my head. And then the, the third day where I was like, yeah, okay, I accept this. Um, That's quick. Was, was enough. So it was enough to make me think that, you know, the days after the days and weeks afterwards, I realized that, okay, if I can get used to something that quick, if I can adapt that quickly in my mind to something like that, that I think is so horrible. Oh, no. Looks like we got sorry. connected. Yeah, sorry about that. Okay, you were saying about if you could adapt to something so negative. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess, um, you know, uh, weeks weeks after that, I was just thinking, um, if I can adapt to something that I perceive as that negative, then anything that's actually negative, so negative that I am just so disturbed by it really is just a problem of my perception. Right. Mm -hmm. And so like what may be negative to me, like so negative to me and horrible is, is really nothing to someone that is experiencing something way worse. Mm -hmm. Um, So really I have nothing to complain about (laughs) because I can adapt to any situation. Mm -hmm. Um, to a degree. I mean, obviously there's situations where you can't adapt to and you have to, you have to uh, remove yourself from that situation. Right. Mm -hmm. But I feel like a lot of it is in the mind, you know, I don't know. And I think for me, it's, it's, it's kind of like a survival, survival instinct. It's like Mm -hmm. in order to get through it, that perspective helps me get through it. And um, so months after this happened, um, you know, I continued to go through that divorce and after I broke it off, mm-hmm. um, that was really the first time in my life I'd been like alone. And so I'd been basically scared of being alone, um, in terms of just, you know, being single, being, um, without my friend group that I had. Um, and I had to remove all of them from my life because, um, just none of them were a good influence on me. And, uh, and it just wasn't working out, I think. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah. Could you touch a bit more on how you were able to like finish school and become a fellow and all that? Right. So, and kind of when that happened? Yeah. So it, it's kind of weird. Um, the, the letter that I wrote to university and innovation fellows to sort of like, try to to get into it to, to try to say what I'm uh, what I want to become a fellow for that was mm-hmm. the whole thing was written like the day after uh, I found out about um, my ex-wife's affair essentially mm-hmm. um, so these are all like very sensitive things and I don't even know if I should be talking about some of them but um, well I appreciate your transparency I, I'm down to yeah. talk about whatever you want to talk about okay it's uh I mean, and this is, this is another issue. I think that a lot of men in particular are there. It's like, they're not supposed to talk about this because, Mm -hmm. because men aren't supposed to be victims, right. Of, of emotional abuse or of, of lies and deceit from the opposite sex, you know, and there's that role that you have to play as a man that, that you're in control and that, you, you like you're not a victim mm-hmm. and so I feel like there's this uh, this reluctance for um, males to talk about things like this um, because it's it's shaming you know um, but the fact is it's, it's a huge reality for for a lot of people and mm-hmm. you know it goes both ways um, but I think that that's a big factor in like toxic masculinity, for instance, because you, you can't talk about, uh, you can't talk to each other, you can't talk to anybody else. And so you just mm-hmm. keep it in and follow it up and, and you just get angry. Um, 
but uh, to get back to the, to the original point you were getting at, um, how did I get through and, and become a fellow and get through college? Um, I just got really fucking angry, I think. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, that's really what happened. I got extremely angry um, and refused to let anybody get in my way um, to do what I set out to do because mm-hmm. I had tried from day one when I graduated from high school to try to get a goddamn degree. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it's just like just all these side roads and all this trouble and I'm just and I just felt like someone or all these you know I don't know like maybe it was intentional maybe it wasn't but I was just mad at the world I was mad at the universe and I said fuck it I'm just gonna I'm just gonna go straight Mm -hmm. and I'm not gonna stop and I'm just gonna keep going until it's done and it was really exhausting because when you do that you're not thinking about efficiency you're literally just driving yourself dead until you get it done and you're not sleeping you're not doing things the right way and you're just Mm -hmm. grinding until until you do it and so by the end of it when I graduated I wasn't even happy that I was graduating I was just happy it was over you know done Mm -hmm. and I was exhausted and I took a couple months off just working you know clear and brushing the mountains because I just did not want anything to do with technology or sit the city or just anything to do with what I had been doing for the past years you know Mm -hmm. um at that point i was still still had all the the legal ramifications hanging over me and that took you know years after i graduated to clear up so i'm still still dealing with it but no more you know court hearings or anything like that and and the fact is um white privilege definitely definitely took a part in me being able to even get through it mm-hmm. because you know if if it had been any other way i would have just been stuck in the system you know if if i hadn't known somebody with enough money to loan me for uh the lawyer i would have been screwed if if i hadn't if i would have shown up and looked any other way than than a 6 foot white male mm-hmm. Who knows who could have been on the other end of that, that podium and, you know, and just said, no, you're, you're going to jail for 35 years because they throw the max at you and then they decide. And, and I had lawyers telling me, okay, you know, justice is actually dead and it doesn't actually exist anymore. These are lawyers. These these are people that work in the field saying Mm -hmm. these things. Justice is dead. It doesn't work anymore. It's broken. And it's it's literally a system designed to keep you in it and it's modern day slavery because if if you're in prison maybe they're throwing you in a private prison and then you you work for pennies on the dollar and and you're literally a, a slave in a prison mm-hmm. and so it's ridiculous did, was it was it my was it my work ethic that got me through i mean maybe a little bit but i mean Honestly, it was a lot of luck and a lot of chance and a lot of uh, privilege. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of people out there that don't have that. And I think that it, it's it's kind of strange, right? Because when they when they came into my house, guns a blazing, they gave me PTSD. Mm-hmm. But then the thing the thing is the substance that is being studied right now for the elimination of PTSD and soldiers. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Simon, the thing I was growing. So yeah. they were, they gave me PTSD and removed my access to it. Yeah. And to this day, I'm still struggling with, with the, the issues of, of hypervigilance. And, you know, mm-hmm. if I go out and, and, you know, 4th of July, for instance, all these, it's, it's yeah. not necessarily that the sounds of fireworks going off has any recollection of, of guns. It's literally mm-hmm. because my body is so charged all the time now that mm-hmm. loud noises and things, you know, send me kind of into a frenzy. And so yeah. there's a lot of psychological techniques you can do to calm yourself down. But I would love to offline hear about those. Cause I, I feel you like similarly, I hate when cars rev their engines or motorcycles right. 
that gets me every time. Yeah. And going out in public, you know, public places, if it gets too loud, crowds, um, it's, it's all that. And, and the interesting thing is, you know, I had these symptoms. I thought it was ADHD. I, you know, I tried to track it down and then I realized it's, it's trauma based. And so, mm-hmm. um, you know, these aren't the first times I've had these symptoms, you know, they faded over the years, but I had them as a kid too, um, mm-hmm. because of you know various things that, you know, happened when I was a kid. And I think a lot of people here are just, you know, in, in life are just struggling to figure out what's wrong with them because I felt like that for a really long time. There's something wrong with me. If I can't go out in a crowd and, and act like and be like everyone else and I'm mm-hmm. I'm freaking out for some reason internally what is wrong with me and there's nobody there to talk to that's a problem mm-hmm. and there needs to be an open discussion about things like that and people need to feel you know kids especially they need to feel like they can talk to people about those things so they can get help and actual help real help that's actually going to help them and right now mm-hmm. the system whether it's whether it's legal system or the medical system isn't really designed to help you it's, it's designed yeah. to to take your energy, take your time and, and take your resources. Just put a bandaid on it and call it a day. Yeah. I mean, so right now there's, there's a psychological renaissance going on with psilocybin and, and the natural pharmaceuticals that we should be taking mm-hmm. for uh, the elements of, of PTSD and trauma and things like that. But right, but right now the system's flooded with all these, these pills that with shoddy science and mm-hmm. I mean, maybe they work a little bit, but, the, the really big firecrackers in the industry are being blockaded by, by the big companies. And I don't know. I just, I just urge everyone to look into it, look into the science. Um, if you've got, you know, anxiety, depression, PTSD, I'm not saying go out and take these things. I'm saying, look into the science behind it and support mm-hmm. the causes that are being made to get, get these things out there. Um, I mean, it's good to look at the science behind, like, even the pills they give us. You know, anything we're putting into our body, you know, we we just trust the doctors blindly. And we're like, okay, I'm going to take this for my anxiety. But you, it reacts differently for everybody. And, yeah. yeah. And, and honestly, it's uh, half the time their best guess is as good as yours. Because mm-hmm. my experience, um, you know, with depression and anxiety going into – uh, the doctor's office, they're like, yeah, I don't know. Let's try this. And they'll, it's like they, they push out something, see if mm-hmm. this works. And I'm like, okay, that didn't work. That was weird. I feel foggy. I don't feel like myself. Okay, try this. And they'll send you another another thing. They don't know. Mm-hmm. I mean, maybe a really good doctor does, but the fact is if you expect every single doctor in the system or every mm-hmm. single person, or pharmaceutical um, psychiatrist, I can't remember if the psychologist or psychiatrist that actually mm-hmm. sends out medicine, but uh, I don't know. I, I just think that there's a huge distrust in authority right now. Mm-hmm. And I think it's, it's rightfully so because they've been sending out things that don't work for so long mm-hmm. based on shoddy science. So I'm just extremely passionate about that in particular, because I feel like if you can, if you can stop trauma, you can stop, all the things that span from trauma, you can stop mm-hmm. the hurt that comes from people acting negatively towards, towards each other because mm-hmm. they're, they have this trauma inside of them that they don't know where it's coming from. And they're it's the root cause. Them. Yeah. It's the root cause. If you can attack the trauma, like in you, and you can make people feel empathy for each other, mm-hmm. not force it upon them, but allow them to feel that they feel like themselves again. It's like, I feel like a lot of people have lost that, that, root person they haven't lost it but it's just buried under all these layers of just trauma mm. you know well, it's a lot of it's a lot of bullying. unconscious people who just yeah. kind of like listen to whatever and drink the kool-aid and don't just they don't listen to themselves right they and others touch with themselves. Mm-hmm. That's right. so i mean i guess if i could choose one moral of the story it would be that i mean and you know, there's so many things I haven't even talked about or touched upon, um, but I think that's okay. Uh, I don't know. Well, I think I'd be happy to do a couple interviews, like spaced out, or if you want to talk about something specific, um, I'm down to do that. But overall, 
kind of based on the events you've shared and reflecting back on, you mentioned earlier, you created a lot of obstacles for yourself, but you also, it seems like got past those obstacles. Yeah. And so um, I'm wondering kind of just like how you're doing now and how you continue to like be in touch with yourself and how you continue to change your perception. So it's, you know, so you're in control and sure. it's full of empathy and whatnot. Yeah. I think, um, I, there will, there will always be like, I've struggled with just self doubt and self loathing and just depression and anxiety for so long that I think I've just kind of accepted them as kind of a part of my wiring. Mm -hmm. So I'm not trying to find necessarily a fix for it, but I've adapted to, to them. And one of the biggest ways I've adapted to them, uh, and this, this happened after my, my divorce is because like I had so much self-loathing. Why, you know, why am I the way I am? Like, why am I not good enough? Why am I this way that I went on like this deep search for like being better than I was to mm -hmm. being so much better. And, uh, you know, I, I wanted to be anything other than what I was. It's kind of sad, really. And I it definitely am not that way anymore. Like, I I feel much sympathy for who I was at that time because there was so much self-hatred. But mm -hmm. um, I got into uh, physical fitness, I think, was the biggest thing, to be honest. This was just going to the gym and, and sweating it out. And, and it just makes you feel so much more confidence. Um, you can look people in the eye, you know, Whereas like if you, if you're not working out and you just, your body feels like crap, you just, your emotions aren't flowing mm -hmm. properly. You just don't feel good. You feel bad about yourself. That's definitely going to come across in your body language to other people. And you're not going to you know look them in the eye. You're not going to speak clearly. Maybe your voice kind of is raspy and you just, it's just like, ugh, like I don't like feeling like that way about myself. Mm -hmm. And then I, so I like what I've, learned from the gym is that I want my biggest stre stressor to be controlled. I want, mm -hmm. I want, I want the most resistance and the most stress coming from the gym, a place that I'm controlling it. Because the fact is when I get into a situation where I have a lot of social anxiety or I have mm -hmm. a lot of, you know, say I'm, you know, I'm in a situation that I didn't prepare for. I'm not ready. That adrenaline spike and that, that all that stress that's coming off of me, Mm -hmm. uh, that I feel inside isn't even nearly as much stress as I am feeling in the gym that I've already controlled maybe yesterday mm -hmm. or the day before. Um, so, and, and everybody's wired differently. Everybody's body feels differently, but the way, the way my stress hormones work, that's, that's what works for me. Mm -hmm. Um, and then in terms of, I guess, finding peace, that's, I stopped, uh, I stopped social media. was <laughs> was a big one. <laughs> yeah. To be quite honest. Yeah. Um, it took a while, but, uh, I don't, it's, it's actually hard for me to get back into the swing of social media now that I've, mm -hmm. that I like force quit it. Um, but like, I feel like I have more time. Um, so, but I just want to reiterate that I definitely, um, this is still an ongoing journey for me and I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not necessarily gotten, I've gotten further, but I haven't really gotten where I want to be. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm still trying things out. And I think that, you know, I still have a lot to learn and, and that um, I have a lot of role models that are, you know, that, that I want to emulate. And um, yeah, I just think going outside your comfort zone is another big one. And if you're afraid of something, like going straight for it rather than avoiding it is, is uh, I mean, that's just basic, I feel like. So. <laughs>